So um, you you have my background, and thanks, Janet, for uh, for all of that. And uh, I wanted to actually start with a story. And I think this uh, every time I tell the story, and every time people hear it, it's it's, it's just an amazing story, and it kind of gives you confidence in our our medical system, uh, uh, our being the the world's medical system. Uh, and on December thirty first, um, the World Health Organization basically. Uh, uh, published that there was a mysterious new pneumonia that was uh, that it hit do dozens, get it, dozens as opposed to billions now, dozens of, of patients in uh, the city of Wuhan, China. Uh, the infectious disease doctors there had known about this for about two weeks. Okay, it had grown from an initial discovery uh, and, and a disturbing pattern to dozens. Uh, so from mid-December, uh, until and then December 31st, the WHO basically announced this is a new pneumonia. Okay, so keep that timeline in mind. Uh, by January 11th, China reported the first novel coronavirus death. Okay, on the same day, Chinese virologist published the complete DNA sequence of the uh, corona virus two, the, the novel coronavirus two. The, they had the entire virus sequenced, every single piece of DNA in order sequenced. By Jan January 12th, the next day, uh, they had sent this sequence to the world. 20 vaccine groups were already working on it. So 12 days after the disease was discovered, they had the genome, the whole genome, they had 20 labs already developing a vaccine for this thing. I mean, just imagine the power of that. So by February 10th, look at that, January 20th, the, uh, uh, January 12th, the vaccine, 20, 20 vaccine groups. By the 10th, the first vaccine candidates were designed and manufactured. And then by March 16th, Pfizer and Moderna started their phase one trials. Um, it, it it is actually staggering uh, when you but and but also when you think about um, you know the number of virology labs the amount of brilliant people throughout the world and uh, and the power of collaboration because um, the, you know that every one of these labs they there have been actually a hundred and sixty different projects of developing uh, a, a, a vaccine to this virus so. Um, this this is no small effort, uh, and it really reflects the the power uh, uh, of this process. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the next slide, and uh, right now, just in San Bernardino County alone, these are the number, and this is data taken today: 348,000 Pfizer vaccinations, 324 Moderna vaccinations, and 48,000, roughly 50,000. Uh, Jan, uh, it's, it's actually I was told it was pronounced Janssen that because uh, it's Norwegian uh, or Scandinavian and um, and it's made, that's the Johnson and Johnson vaccine so 48,000 the US uh, uh, 171 million doses have been given and very very few uh, side effects or uh, bad effects so I mean uh, and, and I like to just cite this and, and what other drug do you know of that has been used this much with as low uh, uh, a complication rate or aller allergic reaction or adverse reaction uh, in, in, in terms of safety? I mean, one of the things we talk about in terms of people who, who have vaccine hesitancy is safety. I mean, you think about how many millions uh, actually and, and worldwide, it's even that much more uh, how many uh, vaccines have gone out uh, and what a, an amazing logistical process, uh, the, whole th the whole process of organizing our, our uh, vaccination of our community and our country and of our world has been uh, to see how safe this is. Because you know, by now, you know, if there are any significant complications, uh, and I'm gonna get into those, um, uh, we know about it by now, 171 million, just the US alone. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the messenger uh, RNA vaccines. You know, the people were saying, well, th well, these are the first real uh, uh, vaccines made by the mRNA vaccines. And 
Um, and, and they really aren't because these were actually used uh, on, on the second bullet there to develop vaccines for SIRS, Ebola, and your last influenza shot was made by a messenger RNA uh, vac vaccine uh, process. Uh, the other thing is uh, first bullet, uh, the um, safety. Uh, there were no shortcuts through the three phases, just to, just to kind of go, so you know the, the three phases of vaccine development. And it's really just numbers. Think of uh, 100 or, or less, that's phase one. It, the, the virus is used in 100 or less volunteers just to see if there's anything that, you know, overtly really dangerous, okay? Phase two is like from 100 to, uh, for, to about 1,000. Uh, and that's, um, so that's again, just, to, uh, uh, it's, broadening out uh, to see if there's any adverse effect, any significant allergic re response or um, et cetera. Phase three is getting uh, a minimum of 30,000, uh, usually up to 50,000. So all of these phases were gone through with the, firm, with, the uh, with, with the Pfizer and the Moderna and actually the Johnson & Johnson too. So it, uh, one of the reasons uh, they got through that quickly is that we had so many COVID cases. So it, you know, for for each of these vaccines to get forty thousand, you know, for Ebola, we never got that far uh, because people died, or and it, and basically they died off. So uh, same thing uh, for, um, for 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 SIRS. So um, so the, so none of the three phases for vaccine development for any of our virus, uh, our vaccines so far uh, were passed up. The other thing about this is that the mRNA vaccine uh, process, uh, basically uh, uh, it, uh, it, it had been in development for about 15 years before. Uh, and, it, and it basically, like I mentioned, had, had actually been used for other vaccines as well. So how does that work? Okay, so um, what, we, what we're looking at uh, on the right, the schematic, um, Basically, is you know these red things uh, are the spikes, okay, and uh, the the red uh, in in the uh, in the nucleus. I'm sorry, the uh, the red in the RNA is is right here. That that actually uh, it's the the formula for producing the spike protein, okay. So they take uh, this piece of messenger. They take the DNA and they lay on top of the DNA. The, and they develop messenger RNA, okay? The messenger RNA basically peels off now. It's a, it's a, a large molecule and they coat it with like liposomes uh, so that it can get into the cells. Uh, and then once it gets into the cells, it basically, it, it, it starts to, it's basically like a charge nurse or whatever. It, it comes in and just tells the cell how to produce spike protein. Uh, and so the, uh, the cell, and these are the, the myocytes in your deltoid, uh, the, those cells start producing spike protein without the virus. Um, within a, a day and a half or two days, that cell where the messenger RNA was in dies. Uh, that messenger RNA is destroyed. Uh, but by now we've got hundreds of uh, myocytes, deltoid muscle cells that are producing the spike protein. The spike protein co comes out and gets into the circulation and it's a complex macromolecule, right? You need to be a, a, a macromolecule, a big molecule to generate an immune response. And so what it does is it's now this, um, this foreign protein, this macromolecule in the circulation and the, the body starts uh, producing antibodies. It, it, it activates the two types of lymphocytes. One is the B lymphocytes. Uh, okay, the B, B lymphocytes actually are the ones that produce antibody, okay? Uh, and it activates the T lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes are the ones uh, that actually attack, the, um, they're, they're called uh, killer T cells. Uh, there's one type, and then they're the memory T cells, the ones that remember. Um, so, uh, so this is actually kind of important for you to interpret results because uh, you know, those of you might know people who had, they swore they had COVID, right? Uh, they, you know, they got a bad flu-like illness. They lost their smell. They lost their taste. I mean, that's that's COVID, right? Um, and and then they 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 go on and they get an antibody test, and that antibody test may be negative uh, because it's really uh, the, the biggest uh, line of defense for viral infections 
are the T lymphocytes, the killer T lymphocytes and the memory T lymphocytes. So you can have had the infection, just the antibodies that we get, and they may be IgG or IgM, uh, basically don't necessarily, uh, those don't show up. Uh, some, uh, all the time. So that a person, you may, may draw, draw serologies uh, and be negative and the person really did have COVID. So, uh, and, they're not, and it doesn't measure all the neutralizing antibodies that we see also uh, that are produced to fight the viral infection. So uh, uh, any questions on any of this process? This is just basic uh, viral uh, and immunology. Just, just again, just so you, you can put everything in perspective. Um, so this is uh, uh, just another uh, picture of this. It, uh, it produces the spike protein. The mRNA is uh, made with instructions to, to make viral pro uh, the viral proteins, that spike protein. Uh, the messenger RNA is put into the lipid, coated with fat, injected in, and then it produces um, the spike proteins, which are these, and it produces the immune response. So. Uh, so that's the mRNA. The, um, the M specifics of the uh, messenger RNA, okay? It just instructs the muscle cells on how to make the S protein. That's it. It's destroyed soon after. The S protein is recognized as foreign. The T lymphocytes are killer cells, both, and then both of the, uh, the COVID vaccines um, that are based on this, the Pfizer and, and the Moderna, got uh, emergency use authorization uh, uh, as mRNA vaccines. So remember, the EUA is not FDA complete approval. So that's uh, th that gets into uh, uh, a discussion later on when we, we talk about why can't we just make a rule that everyone has to be, you know, a law that everyone has to be vaccinated. When, when something is approved by the EU, by an EUA, emergency use authorization, it's still kind of experimental, but it's approved because it's an emergency. So you can't mandate uh, a drug or an agent that is approved by EUA. Okay, so um, another thing to just remember, because we, you know, we, uh, when we talk about vaccine hesitancy and people who don't want to receive the vaccine, uh, uh, it, it raises that kind of emotion for certainly for me and I think for all of us. Um, so anyway, the, the Moderna uh, and the Pfizer both 94 and a half, 95 percent efficacy, um, and both extremely extraordinarily effective. Um, the Janssen vaccine, which is the Johnson and Johnson, I forgot the uh, closing parentheses, and it, it uh, it's a modified cold virus, and the adenovirus is, is a cold virus, but they've taken this uh, cold virus, and this is again the power of uh, of genetic uh, manipulation, basically, and they've taken this uh, cold virus or adenovirus, and they've taken out the portion of the the genome that actually uh, causes it to replicate or multiply in the cells. So it's what they call replication incompetent. It can't grow. It can't grow. So um, this Janssen va vaccine takes the DNA and in gene coding for the spike protein and, and, and it puts it into the, the virus. The virus then just bumps into the cells, attaches, gets into the cell, and then pushes into the nucleus. It's not, not the cell nucleus, though, uh, and not, not into the cell DNA. So then the gene is actually read for spike protein. They make my messenger RNA. Now, now it's joined the process for uh, Pfizer and Moderna. Messenger RNAs, RNA is made. It goes into the cell. It tells the cell how to produce spike protein. Uh, it, 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 interestingly, the spike protein then protrudes from the cell and it kill, and the cell, cell gets killed. So... Uh, all those original cells with the at, with the attenuated replication incompetent adenovirus are killed, so uh, it's gone. Uh, and then the body recognizes the foreign protein, and so the B and T lymphocytes get activated. So that's the way the, the Johnson Johnson uh, uh, Janssen uh, vaccine, and you've heard of AstraZeneca, produced the same way. Okay, uh, and. Uh, and then the, the Novavax is, an, is a uh, fifth type of uh, vaccine that's produced. It's, it's a different type of RNA. We won't need to talk about it right now just because uh, it's pretty far away from getting, uh, we may not ever need it, uh, frankly, because we've got the, the, uh, the big three already. The, um, just further on efficacy, uh, you know, we, um, and, and you'll all have 
your patients to talk about this. Uh, the nice thing about the Janssen vaccine is number one, it's just a single dose. Uh, uh, that single dose though produces, uh, you know, the, the initial efficacy for all, uh, for all infections, for all COVID infections uh, is about 68 to 72%. But keep in mind the initial studies for the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen uh, vaccine were in countries like South Africa and Brazil, which had the variants. Now, the, the South African variant and the Brazilian variant have probably at least that much resistance to the, the Pfizer and Moderna. So, uh, so the, uh, that's why uh, those variants are important and, and of concern uh, because there is a little bit of resistance. They are more transmissible. So the, the, the Janssen vaccine was actually tested um, in those countries with Brazil and South Africa and the US. So, uh, so that's why you know, it's six, 68 to 72%, uh, you can't compare the two. Uh, you can't compare the, uh, the, the Janssen to the Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, because they were tested in completely different people. Uh, but the important thing is it, it prevented um, 100% uh, of deaths and severe COVID. Uh, so it's, it, you know, it's a, ex, 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 again, extraordinarily good vaccine. Uh, and, you know, it's really interesting. We're finding from a pub, public health standpoint is it's starting to be the one that's requested most. Uh, and there, were, there have been groups of doctors that just want it too, because they're busy, and they just want the, the one shot. They don't have to have to come back a second time and uh, deal with my turn and all that stuff. So, um, so uh, it, you still need to take home points of, of the odds and is A, it's one dose. B, safer pro profile, by the way. There's much fewer allergic reactions to the Janssen vaccine, uh, interestingly. Uh, three, every bit is effective in preventing mortality and severe COVID. So it works. Um, and, uh, and and by the way, they're all free, you know, right? Uh, 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 some sites may charge for the administration fee, but uh, the federal government is pushing this, and they're not charging a thing uh, for this. So, um, so that's the Janssen. Uh, if you, any of you wants wants to break uh, uh, mute, that's fine, and ask questions, or uh, if there's any other questions in the chat, just interrupt me. Um, so, a couple of things on uh, on on. Children, we you know, we talk about children and uh, you know, you know, and the vaccine, et cetera. First off, children get much fewer infections, COVID infections, and they get less sick. And a big reason, and this is really interesting, there are a couple of really good studies uh, uh, done in uh, one out of Israel, one out of Iceland, uh, that the children uh, up to age ten have fewer ACE two receptors in in their nasal pharynx. So the nasopharynx is where the, the actual COVID uh, virus goes in. You breathe it in. That's why the masks are important. Uh, and it goes in and it, the, the spike protein attaches to the ACE2 receptors, okay? That's why uh, patients on ACE2 receptor inhibitors actually have a, a greater resistance to the COVID. Um, so, uh, and the other thing, uh, so children less than 10, that's why it's TK through six, right? Um, they have fewer ACE2 receptors. It's one of the reasons they don't get COVID as much. The other reason is they have higher circulating antibodies to the spike protein because they get more colds. You know, the average child gets, uh, gets uh, probably around 10 to 12 uh, URIs uh, um, a year. So uh, they get more colds. They have higher circulating levels of antibody. So uh, the studies have also showed that if children get it, they don't get it from each other. They get it from their households. So the, uh, 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 the, the rate of infection of COVID uh, in, in children 10 and under reflects the in, uh, societal rate rather than the rate within a school uh, or within their cohort. So it, uh, so it tr transmission among kids and um, from schools is uncommon. And that's why we have uh, uh, basically this, uh, it, it was really safe before we vaccinated our teachers, but you will, we vaccinate most of our teachers now. So uh, this is less, more academic, but, uh, still, still good to know. Uh, the other thing, uh, new, new, newer news, uh, as you know, that you're hearing that uh, younger people are catching this more. 
uh, COVID more, and it, and they're worried about resurgence from that. There's a few reasons for that. We'll get into the other reasons, but uh, one of the reasons, uh, the biggest reason, is that the younger people haven't been vaccinated, right? All we've vaccinated most of our people over 65 are teachers, transportation workers, food workers now, uh, and that, and then we've liberalized it. So, uh, so uh, mo most of the older uh, people, the elderly over 65, have been vaccinated. So we're changing our our population that's vulnerable too. Okay, so I I, I just threw this in. Uh, you know, the, these this is a comparison, uh, and it's way too small for you to read probably, but um, but you know uh, this this is uh, Pfizer, this is Moderna. The efficacy uh, administrations uh, real similar. You guys are experts in administration already. Possible side effects are mainly uh, you know injection site pain, fatigue, headache, uh, myalgia, flu-like illness. Uh, uh, you know for a while uh, we we thought uh, uh, the the Pfizer Moderna had sign significant allergic or anaphylactic reactions. We're now, you know, and I'll address that in a, a minute, but it's not very big at all. Uh, and uh, Bell's palsy is uh, below the actual rate of Bell palsy and uh, Bell's palsy in the general circulation. So uh, really, not much at all uh, in terms of side effects. This is just a list of the ingredients. The only thing that might be potentially uh, a problem is the uh, is the ethylene glycol. Uh, that's in in the Moderna and uh, to a lesser extent because you know the really basic uh, stuff is ethylene glycol in both. Okay, so anaphylaxis. Uh, you know, we we initially remember we had a, a big uh, a group of like ten people from San Diego that all got an, uh, anaphylaxis with Moderna, and we had to stop uh, production and distribution of Moderna. Well, as it turned out, uh, that was uh, that specific group, and it was the, the clinic, not the vaccine. Uh, uh, it was in their technique. Um, but n since that time, and this is just uh, data, when, when we had total doses of 171 million, this is the incidence of anaphylaxis. It's only five per million doses. And for Pfizer and Moderna, it's less actually, 2.8 per million doses. Just as a for comparison, penicillin has 320 cases per million exposures or doses. So uh, much, much safer than even penicillin. Uh, and all of you who are working in a clinic know, you know when you're giving that bicillin uh, shot for uh, syphilis, uh, uh, you know, the, how many you've given without a, uh, without a reaction. Well, this is that much less in terms of anaphylaxis. So we're not, we're not really uh, concerned about anaphylaxis anymore. We still do, uh, th those patients who are, have a history of severe anaphylactic re uh, reactions to other injections, we're still watching them for 30 minutes. As, and you guys are the ex as much of an expert on that as I am. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, we, it's a concern. You still have to ask the question, but uh, overall, uh, is it a real concern? No, uh, the incidence is, is much lower than regular. Just going through the phases, uh, you probably know, but uh, this was announced just yesterday, uh, Board of Supervisors decided to push that all people 16 and older now are are uh, are now uh, can call in and get a vaccine uh, in San Bernardino County. So, uh, and it was initially announced, you know, for uh, Biden said May 1st, uh, and then California said April 15th. Uh, and, and then Biden came back and said, oh, April 17th, but then San Bernardino County, the Board of Supervisors yesterday said today, uh, which was yesterday. Um, so, uh, so as of today, uh, all people in this county were taking uh, basically uh, appointments for anyone 16 and older. And, what, and, and remember the 16 and 17 year olds cannot get one virus, uh, one vaccine, right? They can't, they, they cannot get the Moderna. It's the, the Pfizer that's been tested from age 16 to 18. Okay, so um, they, they uh, the Moderna has not been cleared for that. Uh, although Fi Pfizer has subsequently done studies to, to actually show people from 10 to 16 are, are safe, but that's not approved yet. So, so anyway, uh, it, uh, it's Pfizer for 16 to 18 and uh, everyone else, uh, all three for all. Uh, Johnson Johnson has uh, has not been approved for uh, for uh, 
le less than 18 as well. So, so as of now, you'll be, uh, and everyone's registering now, I, I believe, to my turn. Uh, we, we also have ours. Uh, uh, this SB, uh, uh, SB19.com, but, uh, but we're converting over to my turn. Uh, okay, so what, what, is, uh, what are the issues right now? Uh, we're vaccinating as much, as fast as we can. Uh, hopefully, we're, uh, oh, the other issue is that uh, uh, distribution has been taken over by Blue Shield this week as well. So we are not, as a county, receiving at what's what's called hub and spoke, receiving vaccine and spreading it to the rest of the county. People are all going through Blue Shield now. Um, so, and our uh, FQHCs are getting it uh, direct allocations. Uh, finally, we were delayed uh, for a little while. Uh, from the federal federal government as well. So, uh, okay. So let's talk about hesitancy. Um, this is uh, really the biggest last hurdle. You know, the first hurdle was uh, we didn't have enough vaccine, and, and you, everyone remembers we everyone wanted vaccine. The clinics and we, we and we uh, and people wanted uh, uh, vaccine. The general public, but they but there was not enough vaccine. Now we we've really cranked up. And we're getting vaccine, and we're we're going to hit a limit. And that limit is really defined as vaccine has uh, by the vaccine hesitancy. That's the last hurdle. There are people that should be getting the vaccine that are hesitant to do so. Uh, we call that vaccine hesitancy, and it is our last big hurdle. And uh, and I want to go through these specifically. Uh, interestingly, we're seeing it in healthcare workers. Uh, when we remember uh, phase one A tier one, uh, we were we opened it up to uh, all the healthcare workers are, that were uh, uh, really on the front lines. And we found uh, when we polled the, the hospitals um, that uh, anywhere from 35 to 65% of the nursing staff refused or, or actually held off on the, on the vaccine. We, we were amazed. And uh, recently we, uh, you know, we have a skilled nursing task force uh, that's been helping with co uh, the COVID patients in, in the nursing homes. Uh, you know, we, we had a great response initially, uh, and then we, we took a look at the staff and we asked the, the administrators for this, the nursing homes, basically, uh, how, how about your staff? And we, we had them do a poll, and again, uh, anywhere from about 30% to 65% had held off on the vaccine. So uh, really maddening, you know, when you think about how effective this has been, what a, an amazing difference it's made, how, effect, uh, how efficacious in preventing death. Uh, and you know, the thing uh, that gets me most, and I'm speaking mostly to, to all you good, good people in the brotherhood who are basically uh, uh, cl clinicians helping to care for patients is that we have a duty to our patients. We have a duty, uh, so we have that extra burden. Once you take that oath to help people in healthcare, uh, you take on an extra burden, and I take that extremely seriously with regard to the flu shot every year, and and uh, especially with the COVID shot. We have a responsibility to our patients and to our profession, and to our oath uh, that we need to we, we we need to get the shot. We we don't we really should not a contract the virus uh, and be able to give it to our patients. It just uh, to me. Uh, that it's a sacred oath that I took, and uh, and hopefully all of you have that same kind of commitment. Uh, and uh, I can't imagine uh, just on the basis of that alone, um, not taking this safe, cheap, effective um, vaccine. It, it uh, but it's happening, and so we need to really reach out. Uh, and and, and re a, I, I don't mean to diss the people who are hesitant right now. There might be some on the call and. Uh, what I mean to is, I hope we can get uh, through uh, that. Is uh, it, it's important for you? It's important for your patients. It's important for your family. Uh, it's important for society uh, that we we get this in, and we really have to work on this vaccine hesitancy issue. Uh, the, the vaccine hesitancy is also big in the African American population. I'm going to get through that, but uh, with the Latinx. Uh, population as well. Both of them have similar uh, increase case incidence, two and a half to three times the incidence of COVID. Uh, same thing, case morbi morbidity and mortality. 
two to two to four times increased mortality uh, uh, from COVID in the African American and in the Latinx population. Uh, and interestingly, uh, and, and this is a perfect description or, or illustration of the the political nature of uh, of these issues is there. Are, uh, uh, Republicans, uh, that, you know, that it's been, this is a consistent m multiple polls now have found that um, up to uh, 49, 50% of Republicans are either hesitant to receive it or just refusing to receive the vaccine. Uh, and uh, and these, the people who uh, refuse are the ones that are they're really tough to, to convince. So let's talk a little bit more about hesitancy. So the current vaccine uptake is skewed, okay? So we uh, Spanish dominant Latinos, this is a, a CDPH slide, and Blacks, African-Americans are very low compared to all adults, 19%. Uh, and the Asian Pacific Islanders also uh, basically mirror the, uh, the state, state residents. A majority of the Spanish dominant Latinos and high percentage of the uh, the Asian Pacific Islanders are very likely, 44, 55% uh, of the Latinos and 44% uh, of the, the Asian Pacific Islanders are, are very likely to get the vaccine, to get the vaccine. Uh, but only 31% uh, of the African Americans feel the same, okay? Uh, so rather than persuade the vaccine rejectors, the ones who just say, I will not get it, was to recommend the experts on vaccine hesitancy are saying, let's go for that 25% of the state's population who are undecided. Uh, and they're undecided for multiple reasons. And we we'll talk about that as well. Okay. So who are the best people? The best people are you who are on this call. Uh, the first, uh, the, they're personal physicians, medical workers, the CDC, um, and this is a CDC slide. So they're going to throw CDC and then family and friends. Uh, uh, the people they trust, uh, and the messaging has to resonate uh, better. If it, and, uh, and it has, and it will resonate better from coming from people they trust. Okay, and then California residents often turn to friends, family, social media, internet. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're trusted. It just means that they turn to the internet, they turn to Facebook, they turn to in, uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, and uh, but they are the best avenues for reaching the greatest volume of, of residents. So uh, we need to know that, and that's why we have, that's why we advertise, that's why we put uh, uh, PSAs out on uh, Facebook, etc. So uh, a little bit, uh, let's dice this up a little bit more. So the, he, these are the undecideds. They'll, they're easier to motivate. A quarter of all of, uh, uh, adults, okay. African Americans, thirty-nine percent. These undecided, undecided. Spanish dominant, thirty-six percent. And you can see this is the total eighteen and above. This is total all eighteen and above people. This is the Asian Americans. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders. Uh, the these are the undecideds. The ten dark chocolate is ten percent. Only ten percent are, are rejecting. These are the uh, African Americans, and, and you know, the African Americans, it, you know. It dates back to Tuskegee. It dates back to uh, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, you know, they, uh, they've been burned, uh, and their natural inclination is not to trust the medical establishment, and and that's one of the reasons. Um, it's a big reason that we have to overcome. And that's why it's so important to let them hear it or have them hear it from people they trust. Okay, this is the Latinx English, the bilinguals, 29% uh, hesitant, uh, and this is the Spanish dominant Latinx, 36%, okay? So the dark the dark brown is the rejectors. These are the undecideds, okay? So, so those are the people, we're really going for those people. And this is our, um, I just uh, snipped this from our own, uh, our, by the way, if you go to our website, uh, San Diego County, uh, uh, SB, uh, COVID-19, uh, sbcovid19.com, not com, the, the vaccinator site, you, you can see all of this. So this is um, the, the percentage of our population that's been vaccinated. This is Hispanic or the Latinx. This is the non-Hispanic whites. Uh, this is the, uh, this big one is the non-Hispanic Asians. And this other big one is the non-Hispanic Native Hawaiians. Um, and allow me to, if, you know, th this, Date, initial data did include a lot of the healthcare workers, the people in the previous tier. That's why uh, it, it's kind of skewed in that way. 
when you look at the, the residents vaccinated, uh, we, we're doing a pretty good job now uh, in terms of this is the number and this is the Hispanic or Latino or Latinx. This is the non-Hispanic whites. This is the non-Hispanic African-Americans. We're st we still have a ways to go with them, the Asians, uh, and other, these are the non-Hispanic or two or more racist. So, so we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, but, uh, but we're really, really pushing uh, the, uh, the, the equity thing, uh, because uh, com com underserved communities basically have much higher rates, much higher morb morbidity and mortality. So why the urgency? Because well, it seems like we're down, our case rates are down. Our case rate, by, by the way, today uh, was 3.8. So it's, it's up for the first time in, a, in over a month. It's been going down, down, down. It plateaued for the last few days. Now it's bumped up because it was 3.6 yesterday. So we don't know, we don't know. So uh, one of the issues that we're concerned about is the variants, okay? Uh, variants occur when there's a lot, when, when the vi virus is really re uh, replicating fast, okay? Uh, you can imagine if you, if you were to make a cake and you, you had all day to make a cake, you'd make almost a perfect cake. Not, maybe not for me, but, I, but for you, if you're good at baking. But, um, but if you, it, it, that's in one day. But if you were asked to make a cake every five minutes, would that be a perfect cake? No, it, you start making mistakes right? Because you're rushing. Same thing with the virus. It, the more people, higher it's re replicating and faster it's replicating, the more mistakes it makes in, uh, when it's uh, dividing. And, and these, are, these are the variants. Uh, and, and you know, right now, the, the growth uh, is controlled in the U.S., but it's getting out of control uh, and they have no vaccine in countries like Brazil, South Africa, and uh, multiple countries in, in Africa. It's, uh, uh, so this is continuing on. The variants do occur, and I'm going to talk about which variants. And then the other thing I'm concerned about is societal behavior. We're opening up now, right? We're on orange tier. Uh, restaurants, are indoor dining is coming on. Bars are opening up. We're allowing uh, events to happen. So uh, more people are getting are mixing together. The, the, I just want to I want to tell you uh, some the taxonomy of variants. There are variants of interest. So they, they basically have, these are variants that have genetic markers associated with changes that cause receptor binding changes and, and they might potentially cut, increase transmission. The variants of concern are, are those variants that, that have known evidence of increased transmissibility and disease severity. And then you have variants of high consequence. There's clear cut evidence that prevention measures or medical countermeasures are, have significantly reduced effectiveness. We don't have any of high consequence yet. All of our variants are these. Um, the, the B117 is the, is the British or UK variant. It's now dominant in the US. 51% of the total uh, uh, COVIDs in the US are the British variant now. Fortunately, not as much in California, 1.7%. San Bernardino County, we have over 500. Uh, we, we initially had a big uh, uh, cluster in Big Bear, but it's all over uh, San Bernardino County now. The South African, uh, B1351, uh, that has been shown to be significantly more transmissible and have slightly more morbidity. Found pretty much in 16 states, we've, we've found a cluster in San Bernardino County. The P1 is the Brazilian, okay? Now in the U.S., it's in 22 states. We've we've also found it in San Bernardino County, and then uh, this is the Bay Area variant. Uh, it's caused thousands in California. 52% in Calif of COVID in California is this Bay Area variant. And then you, uh, just a few days ago, they announced this double variant or double mutant. Uh, the Stanford Vi Virology Lab found it. It has two. Uh, mutations. One is the L452R. It's the mutation found in this West Coast variant. Uh, and it has the other mutation, the E484, found in the South African and Brazilian variants. It's not classified yet because they only have one case, uh, but it's it's uh, worrisome enough. Um, does someone have a question? I heard someone break mute. But uh, So what we're doing now too is we're looking for vaccine breakthroughs, okay? Uh, when to do WGS is whole genome sequencing. If you get one of these, please submit it to the lab. 
for whole genome sequencing. So these are people who've been fully vaccinated, who then who now get a symptomatic COVID infection, COVID-19 infection, despite the vaccination. They're, you know, the myologists, they lose their smell, their taste, their cough, shortness of breath, uh, and they have a fever. So uh, if they do that and they're fully vaccinated, more than 14 days after their second dose for the for, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and more than 14 days after their one dose of Johnson Johnson, if they develop symptomatic infection, send it to our lab for whole genome sequencing because we need to know it's a variant. We need That's a vaccine breakthrough. The other, the other indications are, are a, a vaccinated patient, but with a positive PCR test. Uh, know about CT values, the, the, the lesser, the, the lower the number, the stronger the reaction, the more positive it is. So if it's a positive PCR with a CT of less than 30, then that's a strong reaction. Send it for whole genome sequencing. And the last is if we have a positive test um, and someone is previously vaccinated and they previously, like less than 90 days ago, had a negative test. That's a conversion. Uh, we want to know about it. Send it for whole genome sequencing. Okay, so those are the three things in your clinics. Uh, if you see vac potential vaccine breakthroughs, flag it to, to our, our state lab for whole genome sequencing. We need to keep uh, uh, after these. So th th that's the last I wanted to talk about. You know, the, I wanted to cover the variants. I wanted to cover and, and why we're going the, the the vaccines. We're going great. Uh, and I saved about 15, 12 minutes uh, to go through some of the myths or just open questions. Uh, are there any questions now? Uh, Dr. Saketa, this yes. is Jody. I did Hi, have Jody. one question. Um, thank you for this presentation, it's fantastic. Um, I was talking with a colleague who's up in the San Jose area yesterday, and she was telling me how, you know, the messaging that they're getting, I mean, they're locking everything down and, you know, they're very concerned that the, um, the, the last variant that you discussed, the one that was just announced, uh -huh. um, that it's vaccine resistant and that the, the vaccines aren't working on that. Have, have you heard anything similar about that particular variant? Because they're all very you know, obviously concerned now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the double mutant? Yes. Okay, yeah, it's really hard to tell if this is resistant to the vaccine or uh, or more causes more morbidity because we only have it in one patient. So I think they're more just worried, Jody, uh, and uh, hopefully they can contain this. Okay, because they made yeah. it. She seems to be under the impression yeah. that they had several cases in San Jose. So you know how things kind of snowball. Yeah. So that's yeah. interesting to know. It's just one patient at this yeah. point. Yeah. They haven't told the CB, the CDPH, or CDC, uh, and uh, you know the, the 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 virology labs at Stanford and UCSF. Um, they're the ones that discovered the West Coast variant as well, which is uh, not not nearly as robust as the British or South African or Brazilian, but um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether I quite, you know, th th they react a lot more. Uh, uh, and I, I don't know whether it's because it's, they discovered it and they want it to be important or uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, but well, let's thank hope you. That actually makes me feel better for her. Cause yeah, the, you know, unfortunately I think that the general public is, you know, getting, getting really worried because of maybe misinformation that they're hearing. So yeah, um, yeah. thank you for clarifying that. Well, the other thing is, it's maybe it's not so bad for the people to, to be scared. You know, uh, you know, w when we were talking to pa our patients, uh, I, I, get, I like to give them a spectrum from, and, and even if it's just a friend or a family member, uh, what's your COVID fear uh, fear score? You know, a ten being I'm so petrified, I don't want to talk to anyone, I don't want to go out ever, uh, and zero is I'm not care, I don't care at all. You know. Uh, and so for all those people less than five uh, who are out going to bars, going to, you know, spring break, um, I want them to have more fear. You know, so it's, it's not so bad. Uh, it's bad if, if they're paralyzed with fear. You know, they're at nine or ten. So, uh, so you know, we have to we have to be somewhere in the middle uh, as medical people. We have to be prepared. And so we have to anticipate. And that's what the people in San Jose are doing. They're, they're anticipating that this may be, may, may be getting worse. And, um, and, and what I didn't cover is that, you know, that we have some really good studies now to show that the, uh, the amount of neutralizing antibodies and T cell responses for uh, 
uh, the Pfizer and Moderna are more than enough for the, all of the, the variants of concern that we have so far, the Brazilian, the South African, the British. So uh, the, the, the vaccine covers them. So we're, we're okay on that. Fantastic, thank you. Oh, Mercedes, uh, go ahead and break me up. Yes. Um, hi. Um, I'd like to say first, thank you so much for this presentation. All the statistics that you've um, provided have been very useful, and I think that they're really important to be able to present to the community that is hesitant. My question is, um, how do you suggest we um, combat hesitancy when the, the backlash is in regards to the unknown long-term side effects of um, vaccinating? The uh, the long you know referring to the long hauler syndrome or uh, yeah so like you know what if something appears two years from now for people who got vaccinated for COVID um, yeah. how would you respond to that kind of hesitancy oh I see the delayed uh, side effects from the vaccine right not not from COVID yes. I see yes from the vaccine yeah there there really haven't been any studies uh, on on any vaccines that have shown. Uh, a, a, a prolonged latent period. Um, so you, you really have to just look at the mechanism for an adverse reaction. Usually it's like um, uh, the immune system gone awry, right? If it's the immune system that's IgE, it's anaphylaxis. If the, it's the immune system that's uh, uh, IgG and IgM that produces inflammation, you know, those all those in, inflammatory markers, then uh, that's the immune system that's gone awry. Um, so it's usually uh, all of those are within uh, the, you know, the first week or, or, or two at, at the most a month. Uh, Guillain bre maybe there's a delay of, uh, you know, we've seen that with post flu shots, right? And um, so th that maybe, maybe occurs a, a, a up to you know anywhere from uh, two to four weeks after. So, in terms of just uh, uh, the mechanism, it doesn't it doesn't get incorporated in the DNA, so it doesn't stick around. The, M the the mRNA gets destroyed in 18 hours; it doesn't stick around. Uh, and the spike protein is just spike protein. So, um, so I uh, it just hasn't happened, uh, Mercedes. So it's um, and I think I just be really positive and reassure them that this this has there's no example of that with regard to any shot, and there's uh, and and it and we haven't seen it yet. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Good question, though. I'm gonna uh, I'll just stroll. We can stroll through these myths if you want, or we can just end it early. Uh, um, and and I'm here and more interested in the, the questions you guys have. Uh, these, are, these are just FAQs. Uh, it's not not safe. It was rapidly developed and tested. I, I think I've answered that. Um, I've already had COVID and I've recovered, so I don't need to get a vaccine when it's available. By the way, they just came out with a, a, a recent study uh, just two days ago that was published uh, that people who've had COVID uh, and then they get their first dose uh, and then they tested them for neutralizing antibodies, the good antibodies against all of the variants. And the minimum, let's see, I wrote it down. The minimum number uh, uh, of uh, a time uh, of ex exponents for uh, antibody to any of the virus, viruses was like tw uh, 90 percent. Uh, 90, 90 times more than they needed to, to neutralize the virus. So, uh, and it went all the way up to 300 uh, times what they needed to neutralize the virus. So someone who's had the COVID and gets the vaccine is probably even more protected uh, than, than someone who's just had the vaccine alone. So, so we're encouraging it for sure. Uh, and, and it's very, very patchy and spotty that people have had COVID and they get, uh, in terms of their immune immunity. So we'd rather them get the strong immunities because of variants and everything else. So uh, so that's why if they've had it, they should definitely receive it. Um, severe side effects, I think we've talked about that. Anyone want to talk about any other side effects? Uh, you know, the biggest thing now is with AstraZeneca, uh, uh, there's this uh, cerebral sinus uh, uh, or cavernous sinus thrombosis uh, but but even that, it, there's only 17 cases out of 
like 20 million, but but still uh, in, its, in younger people. So uh, they're holding off right now on, on that just because of that side effect. But uh, the, the vaccines that we're using, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson, uh, really no, no significant severe side effects. Um, you, we know about the CDC requirements now. If you're, if you're fully vaccinated, it's more than 14 days. Uh, it, you know, you can have meetings, you can, uh, you can hug people who have been vaccinated, et cetera. So you're pretty safe now. Uh, and, and we had to divide the line between opening up society and giving you an advantage to being vaccinated uh, versus, uh, you know, basically <laughs> encouraging everyone to take off their masks and run around and have parties. So, uh, so uh, it, you know, the, we've really loosened up. We're going to progressively loosen up. You know, there's a lot of debate about a vaccine passport now. And uh, we remember EUA, uh, the emergency use authorization, we can't pass a law, but, you know, private enterprises can say, uh, uh, we were going to reserve most of this section for people who are vaccinated. The people at the very top no va are the ones uh, can, that can sit up there <laughs> uh, with, if, you have, if they haven't been vaccinated, something like that. But um, so hopefully they'll, we'll develop incentives for the people to be vaccinated. And uh, one thing I didn't cover, we have four more minutes, seroprevalence. The whole concept of seroprevalence is the people who have natural immunity from previously previous infection and who get immunity from the vaccine, right? That's called seroprevalence, the prevalence or, or incidence of, of, of serologic evidence of immunity. And, uh, and we're up to about 55% in California now. So it's really, we're getting up there. And to get herd immunity, we need about 70 to 75%. So we're getting there, folks. Um, so just, we gotta just keep working and keep vaccinating for sure. And, uh, and that's why we just gotta keep wearing masks too. Uh, last one, and then uh, I'll give you guys a couple of minutes, but um, this is obviously not true. More people would die as a result of negative side effects of the vaccine than would actually die from the vi virus. And, that's so untrue. It's so, uh, we we've got over uh, uh, we've got billions uh, worldwide of, of people who receive this vaccine uh, and without uh, nearly the mortality and morbidity, uh, and without that long hauler syndrome that people, even young people, get. So, so all in all, uh, thank you for paying attention. If you are, if you're asleep, that I understand. Uh, if not. Uh, uh, I'm always available for more questions. You can uh, uh, email me or uh, go through Janet or Jody, uh, and uh, I'll be more than glad to uh, to uh, talk about any questions that you have. So. Uh,